it's uh, Thursday night. Classes got canceled on Wednesday because of the weather. So I'm here at my home office and well, let's talk about databases. So for today, we're going to have the third and final lecture on in-memory multi-version concurrency control. And so for today's class, we're going to go into more detail into how we do garbage collection, which is a very important part of doing MVCC. And the idea here is that we're going to go more detail than what we've talked about so far because we want to understand now how garbage collection and the need to be able to do it permeates throughout the entire system and start to understand again how we're actually going to build a real system that can do all these things that we talked about. So we've sort of already defined obviously what garbage collection is before so I just want to re reiterate uh, or it, it, it again. And it's this idea of determining when physical versions are, are reclaimable. So transactions come along, they're going to update existing logical tuples in the database. And under MVCC, that's going to cause us to create new versions because we don't want to overwrite the old ones. And so those older versions at some point would no longer be visible to any other active transaction. And therefore, it's, it's deemed reclaimable, meaning we can free up the memory and reuse it for something else. Also, obviously, too, if a transaction does a bunch of updates that creates new versions, but then they get aborted, then we want to go back and, and reclaim that memory as well. So again, the idea here is that we, we, we want to be able to prune out the old versions unless we're doing time travel queries. But for our purposes in this class, we said we're not going to make that assumption so that we can, you know, memory. So again, the, the, the basic idea of how garbage collection is going to work under NVCC is that all that metadata that we've talked about the last two classes that the database system is going to maintain inside of the tuples to figure out the visibility of versions, right? To figure out in my snapshot, what tuple should I be able to see? That same meta metadata is going to then be used to figure out uh, what tuples or what versions are reclaimable and therefore we can free them up. So there's, uh, there's a couple of things we need to talk about though going forward today that's slightly different than what we've talked about so far. And this is going to set the stage of why we need to do more sophisticated garbage collection than what we've been assuming. So up until now, we've assumed that we've been focused primarily on OHP workloads where the transactions or queries that are updated in the database are short-lived, meaning they're going to, you know, they're going to do some operation and commit in, in milliseconds. And so this means that because the transactions are short-lived, then the visibility of older versions is also short-lived, meaning the garbage collector can come along and, and free up memory uh, fairly quickly um, since from the time it gets invalidated or, or yeah, it gets expired to the time we can go uh, uh, remove it. But now if we want to think about HTAP workloads or HTAP environments, where it's a, an amalgamation of the fast running transactions and the longer running analytical queries. Now if those analytical queries are running under uh, snaps of isolation as well, then they could cause the garbage collector to get paused because it's not gonna be able to go and, and clean up old versions because there's still some query running that's, that's still active that could still see those old versions. So I had you guys read the SAP HANA paper on garbage collection and they talked about how uh, some of their customers, they saw queries running for hours. And so the garbage collector again, again gets paused. All these old versions get backed up. You can't remove them uh, because you have to wait for those long running queries to, to finish. And they talk a little bit about how sometimes the long running queries could be people wrote, they wrote crappy code or bad code that was holding on the cursors longer than they should. But in some cases it could just be there's queries that are actually do need to run that long. And again, you can't, you have to let them read the, the, what they need to be able to read because under snaps isolation, you know, it, you, you need to be guaranteed you see, all, you see all the things that exist at the moment you started. So what are some of the issues now if you have these, these, these old versions that you can't free up? Well, the most obvious one is that now you have increased memory usage, right? Because now the, all these old versions you can't remove because you're waiting for those old query, the long running queries to finish. Now you're just allocating more and more memory to store all those versions that are getting piled up behind it. Right, because you're still running the the OHP side, you're still running the transactions that are updated in the database, and they're going to create new versions and need, need to store all those versions. So, right, this you know, memory is not cheap. 
uh, not only to buy and, and procure in your machines, but also to actually maintain because you have to give it, keep giving it energy to, to store the charge. Um, so, you know, having to, to, to use a large amount of memory on your machine just because there could be a spike in, in memory usage because these old versions you can't clean up, that's not a good, uh, you know, proposition or selling point for a database system. The other thing now, too, is that if we end up allocating more memory, we're having to go to the operating system to get that memory. And the operating system is our enemy. We don't want to ask it for as, 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 we want to ask it for as few favors as possible. So having to call malloc and occasionally malloc will have to go down to the, to the, to the, the operating system to do a syscall to extend its, its, the address space for the process. We want to avoid that as much as possible. So if we find ourselves having to allocate more and more space because we can't go back and clean up old versions, then that's more syscalls and the OS is just going to get away, get, get in the way of our life. So we want to try to avoid that as much as possible. Now, up inside the database system, obviously now if you have these old versions, depending on the version storage scheme you're using and what order your version chain is being maintained, now you could have really long version chains that are going to be really, that going to be long to traverse in order to find the correct version that your, that, that your transaction needs. So if you're doing newest to oldest, not that big of a deal because most of the transactions are going to need the latest tuple or latest version and that's always going to be at the head of the version chain so you're not traversing that uh, a long chain but in case of like hackathon for example we saw it was doing oldest to newest so now if you have this really long version chain you have to traverse that every single time just to get to the the version that you should be seeing right because again you have all these old versions that you can't clean up because there's a long running query blocked the, the garbage collector the Next issue is a bit more nuanced, um, and it's actually something that, that really doesn't come up in academic papers too much, but the what will happen is that uh, if you have these long periods where you can't collect any garbage uh, because you have a query that, that's, that's uh, blocking the garbage collector, then that query finishes, and now there's a whole slew of, of old versions that you can go clean up, now your garbage collector is going to go, to go go to town like it's on cocaine and it's going to start, you know, snorting up and deleting all these old versions to start freeing up the memory. So that's going to spike the CPU uh, during this period because it just has a lot of computational work that it needs to do. So this is not good um, from a sort of uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a commercial or real world deployment setting because people don't like, you know, wild swings in performance, right? Because during the period that the garbage collector is just freeing up all these old versions that have been that have been that, you know piling up for the last two hours, the CPU is going to be spiked because it's just finding them and freeing and freeing and freeing over and over again. So any query then that, or transaction that's going to run during this during this uh, garbage collector spike period is going to end up having lower latency, uh, just because you know you're using the CPU now or, or multiple threads now to do garbage collector to free up as much memory as possible, so people don't like that, right? People don't like having the P99 latency of transactions wildly fluctuate for random periods of time, right? So this is bad, and so we ideally we want, we want to be able to have the garbage collector run incrementally, do a little bit of work uh, every so often. And that way, we smooth out performance and don't have wild oscillations. Now, the last one is also a bit more difficult to, to sort of wrap your head around, but we'll, we'll cover this uh, later in the lecture and it'll come up more and more uh, when we talk about uh, other storage issues, is that if now we have uh, versions that are being stored in, in all sorts of you know, random locations in these new blocks, then what will happen is when we go now back and delete all these old versions, you're going to have these in a block and have a bunch of gaps uh, or empty space where versions used to be, but now you deleted them. But now there's maybe one or two versions are in that block that are still active. And so now, you, but they were modified, you know, from a you know, few hours ago or, or, or some other time. And now you're putting other new versions in there that, are, that, are, that don't sort of fit in the same... Um, we're not added to the database system around the same time that the versions are that the versions in that current block were added. 
And so what you end up having are within a single block, if you have this, this long period where you can't clean things up and then all of a sudden you just open the floodgates and free up all this memory, is that you're gonna have tuples that could be added, tuples within a single block could be added to the database at dramatically different times. And therefore they're gonna have different access patterns or, or that transactions are gonna access them. And that's gonna end up causing more cache misses. It's gonna make it more difficult to do compaction and compression and other things because now you're gonna have tuples, some tuples are gonna be old and some tuples are gonna be new within a single block. All right, so I'm being a bit hand wavy about this part. This will come up uh, later, in this, later in this lecture and then again later in the semester. Um, but the basic idea that we think about this is that I'm going to have, if I can't cr uh, free up memory uh, within a block, then when I go free that memory up later on, with the garbage collector, I'm now going to have a bunch of space and I'm not, I could put new tuples in, but they're going to be mixed together with old tuples. And I, that's not usually good for, for, uh, for cache locality and other things that we'll talk about. All right, so for given these problems, today we're going to talk about um, mostly about garbage collection. But before we get there, there's a bunch of stuff I need to talk about with, with MVCC, uh, how, you, how you build a system using MVCC that I should have covered in the last two lectures that you kind of need to understand or understand the issues we're going to deal with when we do collection. So... First thing I want to talk about is how we actually handle deletes in, in, in memory MVCC. Let's talk about how we do indexing with memory MVCC in particular. It's not so much whether you're using the logical versus the physical buffers or the indirection layer that we talked about in uh, the first lecture. Um, it's really about how the index is now going to store information about versions inside, inside of itself. Right? And then we'll get into garbage collection, and then we'll talk about block compaction, which is basically coalescing, uh, once you free up a bunch of memory, what do you actually do with it? So the idea that we have to deal with, just like when we do an update, with a delete, we logically want to delete the tuple, but we physically don't want to delete it until we know nobody can actually see it. But we need to actually do something, uh, we need to actually maintain some information to say that a logical tuple was deleted, right? Because then if it's deleted, we want to make sure that there's no new version that's added to the chain after that. So this is a good example of why using the simple rule to avoid write-write conflicts of first writer wins makes your life easier. Because now you don't have to worry about the case of some transaction deleting a tuple and then some transaction trying to update it and how does that fit in the version chain, right? All that goes away if you just say whoever writes to it first, whether it's, whether it's an update or a delete, they always win. So what we need to be able to do now to handle deletes is just have a way to, to, to mark that we've logically deleted the tuple, and then we'll go ahead and garbage collect, garbage collect it later on. So there's essentially two ways to do this. So the first, as far as you know, is probably the most common one. And this is where you just have a little, little flag, a little bit, to say that a, a tuple has been deleted. And so this is, gets always added uh, to the, the, the newest physical version of, of, of the tuple, right? And then that way you just know that there's nothing else comes after you in the version chain. So the two ways to actually do this is are to either store it in the uh, version, the, the tuple header, right? There's a little extra space. We can store some extra bits, some flags to say some information about, about the tuple. Or we can store this in a separate column. It just is a bitmap that says whether we've, uh, well, you know, whether this tool has been deleted. So in our system, which is based on Hyper, we do the separate bitmap column. The uh, the downside of this obviously is that you're now storing space. So you have this store extra space to say this that to just to keep track of whether tool has been deleted or not. Um, it's one bit per tuple. Uh, if you pack the bitmap, you have to pad it out, which we'll talk about later, but it, it's not that big of a deal. Like most people aren't gonna be deleted, and yes, you're storing space for things that, that are, it's always gonna be mostly false, but it, it makes your life easier if you go this route. The other approach is you use what's called a tombstone tuple, and this is where you append a new physical version at the, at the, uh, you know, the head of the version chain at the end, depending what, how you're doing your ordering, 
that has a special uh, bit bitmap flat uh, pattern in the next pointer that you check when you're traversing the version chain. If you see that bitmap pattern, which is a is a is an inexpensive operation, it's one instruction. Then you know it's a special marker that says that the tuple you're looking at represents a a marker to say that this tuple has been logically deleted at this point in time. So you could just store this this uh, special tombstone tuple tuple within the regular table storage. Like if you're doing a pen only, you just store it as a regular regular row. Um, a, but the problem with that case is if your tuple is really wide, if you have a lot of attributes that take a lot of space, then you're allocating a bunch of space for, you know, for you know, just to store that, that bitmap pattern and just kind of wasteful. So one way to, to overcome this is that you can have a separate pool of tombstone tuples that just have the, the, the metadata about the timestamp ranges you need to figure out when this delete actually occurred. But then you just have the, 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 you don't have any of the data attributes. You just have that the the next the the pointer with the the bitmap pattern. And for this, it doesn't matter. Uh, you can actually share the pool across all different tables. Like there's nothing about the, this tombstone pool that's specific to any particular table, right? Um, right. You, the only thing that matters is is that pattern. So again, as far as I know, everyone implements the first approach. Uh, we, in, in Peloton, we actually implemented the second one. I don't remember why we did that. Um, and actually, in the first implementation, we didn't actually do the, the tombstone pool. We actually allocated the new tuple just to store that the, the tombstone flag, which was a bad idea. Um, we eventually got rid of that. And then, of course, now we, we switch over to using the, the separate deleted flag, which is the right way to go. All right, so the reason why I was bringing up deletes is because this is going to complicate some things now that we need to talk about with indexes and, and garbage collection. So we've already talked about before with indexes of what, what's actually in the values, right? Is it the physical pointer to the head of the version chain or is there some kind of indirection layer? So the thing to understand about indexes in multi-version concurrent control is that as far as I know, most MVCC databases don't store any version information about the tuples with the keys. Right, so there's nothing about the timestamps of when a key was added, when the key was, you know, the begin, time, begin timestamp, the end timestamp that we saw with regular tuples. None of that's actually stored in the in the in the index itself. Um, I think the reason why is because a lot of times in database systems, they, at least in the, the newer ones, they sort of there's open source data structures you could use that aren't going to have any of this versioning information there. Um, you'd have to build something custom to do this. Uh, we can take this offline about whether this is actually a good idea or not. But as far as I know, nobody actually stores any version information about, key, about tuples in the index itself. The only exception to this would be something like if you have an index organized table, right, where the, like in, in, in like a B plus tree and the leaf nodes actually store the, the, the tuples themselves, like MySQL does this. Um, in that case, you could argue that the version information is actually in the index, um, but not to the same level that we're talking about here. So that means that every single time we want to say we follow key and it's going to point us to some, 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 some version chains, we have to traverse that version chain to figure out whether the key we found is actually visible to us or not. So the, what we're going to be able to do, though, is that we need to have every index now be able to support duplicate keys because the same key may appear, disappear, and reappear again in different snapshots. So the same key may, may end up pointing to, to multiple version chains. And this is what I'm saying, like when you say, give me a bunch of keys uh, from the index, or you do a fetch on a single key from the index, you may get back a list of version chains that you didn't have to follow to figure out which one's actually the correct one that you're looking at. And so this is gonna happen for both primary keys, or sorry, non-unique secondary indexes, also, but also primary key indexes and unique indexes. So all indexes in the MVCC database, unless there's version information in the index itself, which at our point here, we're assuming it's not, then you have to follow the version chains because you may get back multiple entries. So this is tricky to do. So let's understand why uh, we have to do this. We have a table with a single tuple A, and right now it only has one version, and there's an index that, that points to the head of the version chain. 
So for this, we're going to do, we're not going to do the full hecaton um, of MVCC here, but we're going to do something that's very similar. So you're going to have transactions are going to start, they're going to begin timestamp, and then they'll have a commit timestamp. So we're going to have one thread uh, that's going to start a new transaction at timestamp 10, and this transaction just wants to do a read on A. So it follows the index, it gets the head of the version chain, we're going oldest to newest, it sees that the tuple, the version A1 is visible to it, and that's the one it's going to end up reading. Now we have another thread uh, that's going to start a new transaction at timestamp 20. The, the, the first transaction in thread 1 is it's still running. So this transaction wants to do an update on A. So again, follows the version chain, finds the head, appends a new version after that, updates the, the, the version pointer to now point to our new tuple, and then flips the end timestamp at the first version. So now this tr second transaction wants to do a delete on A. So for this, it doesn't matter whether we're doing the deleted flag or the tombstone tuple. We just somehow we're going to mark this thing as deleted, and and other transactions won't be able to see that see that update. So for this, uh, now the second transaction wants to commit. It gets the commit timestamp twenty five, where we go back now and uh, update the 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 timestamps in the old version and in our new version, which end up we end up deleting later on to now be twenty five. And then we, we commit and we're done. So now, transaction, the transaction at timestamp 10, thread 1, it's still running. But now a third thread comes along, starts another transaction at timestamp 30. And this guy wants to do an insert on A with the exact same key that we were using for, for, for before with A. So at, at here, it sees at this point in time, it sees the change. Uh, the, uh, the modifications made by this by transaction two in the second thread, since that transaction had committed before our third transaction started, it, the third transaction sees all its changes. So that means it doesn't see A anymore because the second transaction deleted it and committed. So it sh it's allowed to do an insert on A, um, but now we got to start a new version chain because we can't connect it to the old one because that one has been deleted. And we said that once we delete a, once there's a delete marker at the, at the, at, at, in our version chain, there can't be a, another version that comes after that. So this is treated as now completely separate logical tuple with its own separate uh, uh, version chain. So we're gonna start its version ID at A1 again. Um, and then now in our index, we have to have a pointer to point to our new version chain. But because our first transaction in thread one hasn't hasn't committed yet, we can't get rid of get rid of the, the old version chain pointer in the index. So we have to be able to support both because if thread one comes along and does another read on A, we want to make sure that it goes sees that first A, version A1 that it saw at the, the first time it ran the query. Right? It can't see the second one because that's from a transaction that's modifying the database and hasn't committed yet. Um, and you know it would violate snaps to isolation if it was able to see that. So this is so this is the tricky thing we have to be able to do that you don't have to do under a single version system, right? If something gets deleted, uh, you just you know you can delete it from the index and not worry about somebody else uh, being able to read it. Now you may have to do some extra work under serialized isolation, but um, at a high level you can just remove remove the index remove it from the index right away. So. What does this mean? So this means that the underlying data structure for every for every database index in an MVCC system has to be able to support the storage of non-unique keys. And we covered how to do this in the introduction class, right? Whether you have a, a linked list or whether you're uh, duplicating keys in the arrays, it doesn't matter how you're actually doing it. You just need to be able to always support for every index non-unique keys. Of course, now this means that some since some indexes will be logically unique, the primary key or you know, declaring an index is unique when you create it, that means that we need to do some extra work in our execution engine in the database system to make sure that those things are actually truly unique. Right? It wouldn't be good if we have a primary key, uh, and because we have to support uh, multiple version chain uh, pointers in the index, uh, we, could, you know, we, we could insert the same key multiple times. Right, so we need to make sure that doesn't happen, even though underneath the covers we have to allow for it. So the way you, you do this, and you'll see this later on in, uh, in our own system, is that you have to basically do a conditional insert where you check to see whether the key exists, and if, if not, then you're allowed to insert it. Otherwise, you throw an error. And you have to do this all atomically. 
like the weather that means you 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 can do this in a latch free way or with with a with a latch on on the, on the node you want to insert into or you want to sort in a virtual node in right it 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 doesn't matter how you actually do it it, it needs to be guaranteed to be guaranteed to be atomic so Again, now on the implementation side of things, we have to write this extra code in our execution engine when we use our indexes, where we have to be able to handle the case where our workers may get back multiple virgin chain pointers for a single uh, fetch on a key. And then we have to follow those virgin chains to figure out what's actually visible to us. So what I mean by this to say back here, uh, when thread one did that second read on A, it's going to get back Two, uh, two results for that single key A, right? It's going to get back the one that it saw the first time plus the new one that uh, thread three uh, just installed, right? And it's going to have to go and figure out which ones are actually visible to it, right? Which tuple should, which tuple version should be visible to it? And they can do some additional logic to say like, well, if I know that my uh, it's a unique index and therefore I should only see one version chain. As soon as I find the one that matches me, then I, I know I'm done. If it's non-unique, then you got to go look at potentially all of them. All right, so now we know how to do deletes, handle deletes in MVCC, and now we know how to handle indexes. So let's actually talk about now what the paper you guys read from the, the SAP HANA team on how to do garbage collection. So in this paper, they have focused on the two main design decisions that, that they cared about was the granularity of garbage collection and the comparison unit. Um, I'm gonna talk about a little bit more about how you do index cleanup and, and go into more detail about the version tracking stuff that we talked about when we read the best paper and now put it in the context of this the SAP HANA paper that you guys read. So like I said, the reason why I picked this paper is because, uh, well one, it's like the only you know research paper that's out there in Sigma or BLDB that covers uh, in-memory multi-version control garbage collection. And I really like that. And I, I do also like how they couch the the problem they're trying to solve based on the real world issues they were seeing with, with customer applications, which is which was nice. All right, so the, the first issue we gotta deal with is how we wanna clean up our indexes. So we just talked about how we need to be able to handle uh, multiple version chains for a single key in our indexes on uh, with MVCC. But now the question is, how do we go back and remove the tuple keys from our index when we know the versions that correspond to those keys are no longer visible to any active transaction, right? And so the basic way you do this is that just in the same way that we re record the read-write set for transactions in the internal metadata, to figure out what they actually did when they ran and then do some kind of validation later on when they go try to go, go commit. We basically want to maintain an internal uh, log entries for how every transaction uh, modified indexes. So you basically keep track of here's all the, the un here's all the indexes I, I modified, either adding a key, deleting key um, as, as my transaction ran. And then depending on when you, the transaction commits or aborts, you can go back now and uh, reverse those changes. So where things get tricky now is if you have to, um, you essentially need to be able to know what, were this, what was the timestamp of the transaction that ran when it made these changes. So you can go look in the catalog and figure out what indexes are actually visible to me at, at the moment I applied these changes. Again, we'll talk about transactional catalogs in, in a few more lectures. The basic idea is in the same way that you can have snapshot isolation for the actual tuples of, of the table, you have snapshot isolation for what tables, what indexes, what columns exist as well, as long as everything's run under the same uh, under, under the same MVCC protocol. So I do want to talk about a mistake that we made in, in our Peloton system. Again, this is just sort of a, as a side comment to talk about what we got wrong in our first system we were building here at CMU and you know, sort of why we had to throw it all away and start all over again. So that's one uh, in particular bothered me a lot. So we had this issue where we were trying to be smart about how we would store multiple updates to the same physical version within the same transaction. So we were trying to be clever and say, rather than creating a new version 
if a transaction updates the same tuple multiple times, we would just always overwrite the old version with the uh, within our transaction with our new information. Right? So say we have a transaction here, starts with timestamp 10, it does an update on A, and let's say this thing, this thing updates the key to be 22 for this, this tuple. So this is the first time we've updated this tuple within this transaction. So we would, we would append a new version, add a new entry in the index to point to our new head of the version chain, um, and things are fine. But now this transaction updates the same tuple again, and say it now sets the key to uh, 333. Again, everything we talked about so far, we would say, all right, we just create a new version, just like we did for A2, we'll do the same thing and make a new version for A3, a new, you know, new physical version in our table space. Instead, what we would do is we would just go back and find the, 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 the tuple that we mod or the version that we created and just overwrite it, right? So A2 no longer actually ever existed. We only had uh, the new version A3. Same thing, we do this again for key 44, sorry, key 444. We go back and update the, the version that we created. So wh what's wrong with this? Well, what would happen is now if our, if our transaction aborted and we got to go back and roll back all our changes, if we weren't tracking the updates we did to the index for all those new versions that we created, so key 222, key 333, then we had no way of knowing what the hell we actually put in the index, so we couldn't go back and remove those things. Because the way we were doing it is we would just go look and say, all right, well, I need to roll back this transaction. What keys, uh, what versions did I create? Oh, I see in this case here, I created A4. So let me see, oh, I, I modified the, the key we have on our index to be 444. Let me go delete 444 from my index, but it doesn't know about the, the other two that it did. So the transaction would commit, we think we garbage collected everything it was, it was, uh, that it created, but there would be a bunch of keys that would point to nothing uh, in, in our index because we didn't know to go back and, and remove them. So again, the two mistakes here were, one, we were overwriting the same, same entry multiple times. And again, we were doing this because then you didn't have to go malloc a new space or get a new slot to put a new version in. Uh, it was a sort of like, this is not that common, so it wasn't like that big of a win for us. Um, I don't know, I forget why we did it in the first place. But, you know, it, it did reduce contention to trying to get a, a slot. But the, uh, you know, this prevented you from doing things like knowing exactly what the hell a transaction ever, ever did. Um, it also made it impossible to do save points because you couldn't go back into a different save point because you just overwrite whatever your save point was every single time. The other issue was that we didn't, we weren't recording at like a per index level what keys we actually ended up modifying. So we did this when we were using append only storage, which again, every single time you create a new version, even if you only update one attribute, you end up copying a whole new uh, tuple, or, you know, the old version to a new slot all over again. So we were doing this the way to again reduce that mem memory copying. Um, now that we switched to Delta storage, which I think is the better way to go, this is really isn't an issue anymore because creating a new Delta record is, is super cheap. It's just the, you know, just the attributes that you modified. So for a pen only, this might be a decent optimization. Um, I don't think it's worth it. And it had, had a, uh, you know, had, had more, it created more problems than it actually solved. So we, you know, this is why we had to get rid of the old code. All right. So now we want to talk about how we actually keep track of our versions. So we already talked about this, right? This was the main thing we talked about when we talked about garbage collection with, uh, in the best paper, right? We said there was two approaches. You can do the tuple level or the transaction level. So the tuple level garbage collection was we didn't store any external metadata about, about transa what transactions we had or wrote to, or sorry, what, what version transactions created and, and and validated when they were running, we would just have this mechanism where as we were scanning the version chains of transaction or of, of, of tuples, if we found versions that were uh, not visible to any actual transaction, we would go ahead and do the garbage collection right, right there. And this could be either a separate separate process, like a background vacuum, like you have in Postgres, or it could do could do cooperative cleaning where as threads were traversing the version chain looking for uh, the right version as they execute queries, if they came across versions that were expired, then they would do the, 
the, the garbage collection right then and there. The other approach was the transaction level garbage collection, which is what the SAP HANA guys are doing. And this is where we leverage the metadata that, that transactions are recording about what they're doing when they, when they were running to then go figure out where are the old versions that we need to go, go remove. So I didn't talk about this uh, in, in the first lecture on MVCC. Um, we're gonna focus on the second approach here because this, this is gonna tie into what the HANA guides are talking about. So the basic idea is that again, as our transactions are running, the same way we have to record the, the rewrite set for validation, um, we just use that information to, uh, we piggyback all the same kind of information to figure out uh, what, what things we need to go do garbage collection later on. So we have a simple transaction here, starts at timestamp uh, 10. First thing it wants to do is do an update on A. Again, it finds the head of the version chain, or find, it finds the tuple that it, that it should read, it just reads that, and it creates a new version updates whatever pointers you have now to, to point to uh, the, the new version you just created. But now we know that we've invalidated, in this case here, version A2. So internally we'll track that in our transaction, say this is the old, this is the old version that we just invalidated. And then all this really is is just a 64-bit pointer to the, to the tuple. Right? That's the only thing we need, we need to restore because um, we know what our timestamp is. So we know that this thing has to occur before us. Um, and we need to go figure out what, how this tuple is actually, what, what the begin timestamp for this transaction is, then we can, we can follow the pointer and go look at that later. But for, now, for this point here, we don't need that. Then we come along with our next transaction. We want to do an update on B, same thing, find, finds the, the latest version, creates the new one, updates whatever pointers it wants, adds the entry to our old version, uh, metadata for our transaction, and, and then we're done. So now our transaction goes ahead and commits. And what we're going to end up doing after we flip the pointers, or sorry, the timestamps in our tuple versions, we're going to now pass along this, our, our old version set to our garbage collection or, or, or vacuum thread, or whatever, whatever it is that's doing the, the, the garbage collection. And we're going to keep track of just for these versions, we know that and it's only visible to any transaction that came before timestamp 15, because that was our, our commit timestamp. So the, the, the garbage collector just keeps that additional metadata to say, here's a bunch of, trans here's a bunch of versions that you, know, you, you want to garbage collect once, once you know there's no transaction that's active that has a timestamp less than, than 15. So that's all really sort of the transaction level of garbage collection is, is just the meta, there's an internal data structure on a per transaction basis, we keep track of what old versions you've invalidated. And then at some later point, somebody else will come along and clean them up. So now what the HANA guys are discussing were how you actually organize and these, uh, these versions, this metadata you're passing along after a transaction's been committed and how you're actually gonna determine whether there exists, uh, where, where are ranges within a the, 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 the timestamps that exist for old versions that you could possibly do garbage collection on. So the first case is, is the granularity. Okay, and the basic idea here is this, how is the database management system going to internally organize all the expired versions that committed transactions have invalidated um, to then be able to go check to see whether they are reclaimable. So the, the trade-off here really is the whether we want to have uh, a really expensive operation where we go check every single individual tuple uh, or every individual version that we've been invalidated to see whether it's now been possibly reclaimable, or we, we, whether we want to group them together uh, with some kind of high watermark to say within a group, here's the, 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 the maximum timestamp that, that has to be um, no longer visible before you can free up the entire group. So again, there's sort of this trade-off between uh, do you want really expensive checks, um, but it can be more fine-grained to give up to release versions more quickly than maybe other buys possible, or do you want to be able to group them together and just when the group's ready to go, um, then you can go ahead and, and, and clean them up. So again, th this is what the two differences are. You, again, the single version one is where you within within every single expired version, you just keep track individually when it's actually been reclaimable. 
Um, this again, it's it's going to cost you more to go check every single tuple. Um, but again, you'll be able to free up memory more quickly. Or in the case of the group version one, it's in, you just organize them into groups and say when the group's ready to go, then they all go. In the case of Hana, the way they are organizing their their versions in groups is within the sort of the commit group ID. So they're already grouping together versions based on transactions, and then when transactions commit, they get put together into a uh, group commit batch, and then they'll get flushed out to disk. So then they just assign the the batch of, of transactions that got flushed out to disk, disk in the same write. Those guys all had the same high watermark timestamp, and when that, that thing status is, is no longer visible to any active transaction, then you can go ahead and uh, reclaim the memory space of all those versions. So again, there's trade-offs between each of these. Um, in their case, they do a combination of both of them. The third approach actually to this was actually pretty interesting, and I have not seen anybody else do this, uh, was the ability to do sort of table-level garbage collection uh, for versions. And the idea here is that, again, what we talked about so far is I update, doesn't matter what table my transaction updated, I just know there's an old version and here's the timestamp of when I, I can go ahead and, and reclaim it. But now if you actually keep track of what table the trend, what table that, that version belongs to, then you can start to do things about understanding all what active transactions exist in the system at this given point in time. And if you know those active transactions will never access the uh, particular table, and you have a bunch of old versions for that table, then since the transaction can't read anything on that table, you can go ahead and, and free up and reclaim all that memory space for those old versions. So this is a corner case, and they talk about how it only can be used when you, again, you have to know what whether a transaction is gonna be able to read a table or not. So you may be asking, well, how, how can you know this? Well, if it's a stored procedure, then you know what all the queries are ahead of time. You may not know exactly what queries are going to execute because there may be conditional branches, like if some value execute this query, otherwise, you know, else execute this other query. But you know within the uh, store procedure, unless they're doing dynamic construction of SQL queries, uh, which we'll talk about later, you have a rough idea of what tables they're going to access. So if you know your table is not going to be accessed within this store procedure, um, then you can go ahead and, and do garbage collection on those on those versions. Um, prepared statements are essentially the same way too. Like if you're running with uh, you know single statement transactions, um, and you know that you know the, the prepared you know the query is ahead of time, then you know if this transaction ex is executing this prepared statement, then you know that information already. So again, this is this is this is. I wouldn't say that this is very. This is the most common thing for most applications. We can look at numbers later on. I do have uh, results from a survey that I did a, a two years ago on this. Most people don't actually don't run with store procedures. Um, now, in SAP, you know, for Hana, their biggest customer is probably the, the, the SAP you know, CRM or the, their enterprise software. So I'm pretty sure in that thing, they, they already know everything. A lot of it runs with store procedures, and they already know what all the queries look like. Um, so in that case, they have better control of they have more metadata or more information about what transactions they're doing than sort of the, the run of the mill application. So in that environment, they may, be able to, you know, they may be able to do this. And that's sort of why they put an emphasis on this. So this is a nice to have feature. Uh, I would say that out, unless you're doing some procedures, it doesn't actually help because you can't do anything. All right, the, the last design decision is the comparison unit. And this is the basic idea here is, is how do I look at my versions and determine whether uh, they're reclaimable or not, right? It doesn't matter, you know, whether they're in groups or a single version or not, how do I examine the, my time ranges of my active transactions and my time ranges of my, of my versions and figure out which ones are reclaimable? So the one thing I'll say about the implementation here is that uh, everything needs to be, needs to be latch free because we want this to be uh, as efficient as possible. And we don't want the mechanism of figuring out, figuring out what versions I can reclaim to block any active transactions that are running. So what I mean by this is that we don't want to have to set a latch on the list of active transactions when the, when the garbage collector runs, because that's going to stall other transactions, new, new transactions from starting up or committing. So 
that means that when we go say, what are my timestamps for my transactions? It may actually be inaccurate. We may end up, you know, it's a race condition. We may end up reading that data structure, that list of active transactions, and we may miss somebody that just started or just finished. But it doesn't matter because if we miss the transaction the first time we go through, we're going to come back again and check it again, and then we'll pick it up the next time. So it, it's okay if the, the, this computation is inaccurate, meaning we miss things. We, we, send up, we end up with uh, false negatives. We miss things that we uh, well, we could have cleaned up, but we, we we couldn't do it. We obviously don't want any false positives. We don't want to re we don't want to reclaim things that shouldn't be reclaimed. And again, just doing this in a latch free manner it just avoids blocking transactions when they're actually running. So the two approaches for doing uh, different types of comparisons are the, the traditional timestamp approach with the, the 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 minimum global timestamp that we talked about so far, and then the Hana guys introduced the the interval ranges, which solve that problem of, of that they were dealing with really long running queries. So again, the, the traditional approach is you just keep track of the, the minimum global timestamp that all versions have to uh, be older than do in order to say that they're reclaimable. And this ensures that there's no thread out there running that could follow a version chain and land on a, uh, a pointer that points to nothing, right? It's safe to implement. Uh, it's easy to execute, um, but again, you just you may end up not being able to reclaim things that uh, you would otherwise be able to reclaim when they actually truly are not visible to any other active transaction. So this is what the interval approach tries to solve. Right, the idea here is that if you can identify the ranges within your timestamp uh, uh, domain that you know aren't visible, then you can go ahead and pull those guys out and leave maybe even older ones st still around, but because any actual transaction can't see the ones that you actually pulled out. So this is obviously more difficult to identify these ranges. The paper talks about a sort of merge-based algorithm to figure this out. Um, it's, it's fine, it's, you know, it's, I don't have any opinion about whether it's a good idea or not. It, it seems reasonable. Um, I think this is the right way to do this. Uh, I We don't do this in our system. Um, but I would say that, uh, yeah, I'd probably say this, this is actually might be an interesting project someone could pursue for, uh, for the, the final project in the course, um, adding support for this. So we can talk about that later. All right, so let's look, let's look at an example of this. All right, so we have uh, one table, single tuple, A. We have one transaction that starts first, again, begins at timestamp 10, does a read on A, follows whatever the index is to get to that version, and just reads that one tuple. Now, while transaction then thread one is still running, uh, transaction in thread two starts, uh, it gets timestamp 20, it does an update on A, we update, we end it, pen a new version, um, this transaction then goes and commits, we update our timestamps with the commit, commit timestamp, and we're done, we're fine. Now thread three comes along, it does an update on A, uh, we create a new version, and then it wants to go ahead and, and commits, and then it uh, updates everything with their commit timestamp. Now at this point here, the transaction in thread one is still running, but it's running at timestamp 10. Uh, so it won't see anything that occurred after, after that. Um, so it, didn't, it doesn't see the change from, from the thread two or thread three. Um, any, any new transaction that comes along after thread three commits can see version A3, but that means this middle guy here cannot be seen by anybody, right? Because there's no other active transaction that's running in this timestamp range. So with the timestamp approach, our garbage receptor cannot reclaim uh, A2 because again, our, our lowest active transaction timestamp is 10, um, and that's and the end timestamp for A2 is greater than that. So we just say, all right, we don't know what thread thread one is actually reading. We just know that th this is our low watermark we can't, we can't pass. So therefore, we have to keep A2 around. But with, again, the interval timestamp uh, comparison unit, we can identify that A2 is not visible uh, to any active transaction because the timestamp of, of any active transaction is not within the interval of 25 to 35. So nobody can see this tuple, so we can go ahead and reclaim it. So again, the computing that interval and, and excising out the versions is slightly more expensive than just sort of the, the, the 
the all or nothing time stamp approach. Um, I actually think the computational overhead of doing the interval approach is the is is worth it over the the, the global minimum timestamp. So this is why I think this is actually a good idea from the Hana guys, and this is something that we may want to pursue later on. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about uh, how to actually free up memory. So we talked about how, to, how transactions delete tuples uh, in MVCC. Um, and we talked about how, how to you know, remove the keys from, from indexes from deleted tuples. That's fine. But now what do we actually do with the memory of the versions that we just garbage collected and removed? Right? So again, we have this fixed length data pool where we have these slots where we can add, tu we add, add new tuples in. So if we now delete a tuple and we've garbage collected it, now we have the slot used to be occupied by you know, that, that old physical tuple. Now it's not. What do we want to do with it? So for the, the variable length data pool, for that one we ignore, we always, you just always reuse that space, right? That, that's a no-brainer. Um, for the fixed length data pools, you may, you may or may not want to actually reuse them. And we'll explain why in a second. The other thing to think about too now is instead of deleting one tuple, what if my transaction comes along and deletes a whole bunch of tuples? So now all within my table space, my fixed length data pool for my, for my table, I have a lot of holes. What should I actually do with them, all right? So let's talk about whether we want to reuse or not. So again, the two approaches are whether you reuse or not. So the, in the first case here, you essentially allow the, the workers on the database system to insert new tuples into the slots where deleted tuples used to exist. So for append-only storage, this is a no-brainer because you're just always adding new versions anyway to the table space. So you just find whatever space you, you just free and just put it in there, right? You don't care about any locality at all. You just put it exactly where, where it was or wh where an old one was. So the downside of this is that you're going to, you're going to destroy any temporal locality about uh, tuples in, in your, your table, right? Because within a single block, you may have tuples that are really old and really new all mixed together. Um, again, for append only storage, this is maybe not that big of a deal because it's just all over the space. For delta storage, this matter, can matter a lot because the, you know, within the table space itself, right? For our fixed length data, we have, in case of hyper, we have these columns, right? We don't have, uh, you know, we don't we don't have versions mixed in together with that columns. All the delta records for our versions are stored in these uh, local memory pools for uh, that are tied to threads, and they get garbage collected later on. But now within our our, our columns, it can be again we have a mix of old and new. Again, when we talk about compression and other things, that can be that can be problem problematic because under in most cases in O2 applications the newer a tuple is, so the more recently it was added to the database system or updated in the database, uh, it's more likely to be updated again. And then as things age, they're less likely to be updated. So now within a block, you could have some tuples that are being updated often and some tuples that are never being updated at all. So the, the way to avoid that problem is you just don't reuse any slots at all. So as soon as I delete a tuple, I never go back and insert a new tuple in in that in its sole slot, right? It's essentially just marked as of, as off limits. So, what does this give us? Well, this solves that problem of the temporal locality issue, where now tuples within a single block would have been added to the database roughly around the same time. Tuple may get deleted, uh, but the, the the logical list of tuples in the block are all been added to the database at the same time. Um, the problem, though, obviously, is that now we have a bunch of holes in our blocks from tuples that are not being, uh, from slots that are not being used, and that's going to be wasted memory. So we need to do something to, uh, to, to reclaim that space. So this is where block, what is called block compaction comes in. Sometimes it's called defragmentation, same idea. So the idea here is that the, we want to be able to identify blocks that are less than, you know, 100% full, 
and try to then consolidate them into 100% full blocks. And then for any additional blocks we have now that we're not using, we can then return that memory back to the operating system, right? right the way I think about this is if I, uh, you know, if I insert a million tuples and I delete a million tuples right afterwards, I, you know, I, I insert a million tuples, I see my memory usage spike up. If I delete a million tuples, I should ideally see it go back down to where it was before. In most cases, that's not going to happen, right? Because the, the data system's not going to give all the memory it allocated back. But I should see it go down a little bit. But if I just delete a million tuples and just keep all that memory around, I may think I, you know, something's wrong with my system, right? So the way we're actually going to implement consolidation, and this is the beauty of transactions, the beauty of, 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 of having uh, of MVCC and concurrent control, is that we want to do this obviously in a transaction safe manner because as we're doing the consolidation or the compaction, we don't want any false negatives. We don't want tuples to not be visible by transactions uh, during that brief window while we're copying it. And obviously we also don't want um, uh, tuples to, to appear twice to any transaction that's running. So the way we do this, do consolidation, is that we just do a delete for every single tuple in a block and then reinsert them into a new block, all in the context of an internal transaction that falls under the same snapshot isolation guarantees of all other transactions. So we just piggyback off all, off all that for free and we get the you know the all the correct mechanisms for ASIN uh, that a normal transaction would have. So again, the, the goal for the reason why we're doing this is that we want to be able to uh, Make sure make, you know maximize the the utilization of memory within blocks, um, and then if we if we're clever about this, we can try to put tuples together in within a block that are related in some ways based on again access patterns or other aspects of of of, of their existence, so that when we do other things on those blocks of cold data, uh, we have uh, tuples that are similar to each other. Right, so the way you think about again, like if you're doing compression, if I, have to, if I want to compress all the block, I want I don't want to have to. If any tuple gets updated in that block, I may have to go do recompression all over again. So I want to make sure that I have tuples that are unlikely to be updated together, uh, all together in the same block. So the two things you talk about compaction are, are I guess, the, or the main thing is really you know how do you identify what to compact and what, what what policy you should use to decide whether you should do compaction and what tuples you, you should try to put together. So it's almost like a bin packing problem. You try to figure out what's the minimum number of blocks I could uh, I, can, I need to use to put all my data in, in, into them, right? Obviously, if I have if I have one block that has one tuple and one block with, an, with only has another one tuple, I maybe want to put those two together to a sub, to a to a new block. Um, but you know, it's, I want to find as, as many tuples as I can to put all together in a single block and then reduce my memory footprint. So how do we identify what block tuples to put together in a single block? So these are just some three basic ways to do this. The first one, which is the time since the last, the transaction was, the tuple was last updated is probably the most common way to do this. Again, as I said, in LTP workloads, the likelihood of transaction will be updated is directly tied to the last time it was updated, right? Think of this like you go to Reddit, nobody's commenting on articles written from three months ago, you're commenting on the articles that were added today. So for this one, what's the nice thing about MVCC again, we just leverage that or reuse that same begin timestamp we're already using to track the visibility of tuples. We can use that to figure out when the last time this tuple was updated and, and, and then you know group them together based on that. An alternative is to actually group together tuples based on the last time they were accessed. Again, the idea here is that tuples that are uh, are read together within the context of transactions um, may want to organize in a single block because then you've reduced the number of, of, of fetches out to memory to go get data for a particular transaction. This one is a bit more tricky to do because it requires you to have keep track of what, how tuples are being accessed. So unless you're doing basic timestamp ordering concurrency control, where you have the read timestamp embedded in the tuple, you have to then 
extend the metadata for a tuple to keep track of this as well, which can be expensive. Again, we'll cover this later on when we talk about anti-caching and shoving things out the disk out of memory, but the, in general, this is harder to do unless you're already tracking this. The last one is a bit more complicated to understand. Um, and as far as I know, nobody, nobody does this, but I know people want to do this, where you can try to exploit some aspect of how ap the application uses data so that you can put tuples together in the same block um, again, for compression or writing out the disk, right? The way to think about this is like, say if I know that within a single table, there's a foreign key relationship between two tuples, and therefore those tuples are gonna be used together often in a transaction. Like one might be read and one might be updated, so they're not gonna have the same, you know, maybe last update, last access timestamps, but I know they're linked together based on this foreign key, so I wanna put those guys into a, a single block. So. This is really difficult to do automatically. Um, it's not clear how useful this is within a single table. We need, if you want to start doing physical denormalization where you're packing two, you know, foreign key references from other tables inside the same block, that actually ma makes a bigger difference. Um, but again, unless beyond foreign keys, it's hard to figure this out automatically. So as far as I know, nobody actually does this. All right, the, the last thing I want to talk about is a special case scenario for compaction of how to do uh, truncates. So the truncate SQL command is basically a delete without a where clause. So it's just delete all the tuples in the uh, in a table. So if you did this the way we've talked about so far with garbage collection and compaction of for every transaction, uh, for every you know every delete, you keep track of all the individual versions you've expired, and then you hand that off to the garbage collector to then figure out whether the version is actually visible or not, and then go ahead and, and, and clean it up. If you do it that way, then if I, you know, if I have a tu table that has a billion tuples, I have a billion versions I need to keep track of, you know, whether I group them together or not, it, it, it's still gonna be expensive. So the way you actually do this super easy is you just do the truncate as a, as a drop table, and then you create the table again, right? The drop table then basically invalidates all versions within that table, right? And then the create table creates the new empty table. So you obviously need to do this for all the indexes as well, right? You drop the indexes, add them all back, and now the indexes are empty. Um, the We will discuss this when we talk about catalogs, but again, the beauty of having all your catalogs be transactional, basically your catalogs, the metadata about your database is stored in the database and you get all the transactional guarantees for free, snapshot isolation for free. So if you have everything be transactional, then doing this, this drop and create atomically in a transaction is super easy to do. Um, we're building this now in our own system. For Postgres, I think their, their catalogs are pretty close to being transactional. There's some corner cases where they're not. My SQL version eight is entirely transactional, has transactional catalogs. Version 5.7 did not. Um, and most major commercial vendors all do this correctly. But again, this is a nice little trick or nice advantage of, again, having transactional catalogs. You can do uh, all this very easy without doing any garbage collection or compaction. All right, so uh, what's the main takeaway here? The, as I said before, and I'll say it multiple times throughout the semester, this, you know, so many of the things we're gonna talk about here are just this classic trade-off of the storage overhead versus computational overhead. So we saw the case of like, oh, well, I, if I do garbage collection based on single versions, I may be able to free things up more quickly and free up memory more quickly, uh, but actually maybe to store some extra metadata about, about every single version of the tuple. Um, but if I do it in groups, then maybe I don't give up, I don't free up memory as quickly, but the the overhead of computing what versions are visible or not, uh, or what, what versions are reclaimable or not is much lower. So again, we'll see this through a bunch of other things. The other thing I wanted to stress too is also you know, sort of why we talk about deletes and indexes in the context of MPCC is putting all this together and handling all the sort of additional things you need to have in a, in a real database system, indexes, materialized views, triggers, and all these other things. Getting all that to work together is, is not trivial. Um, and I think, but I think having a core, you know, uh, transactionally uh, correct, transactionally consistent data, you know, data storage layer 
that you can then build on more complicated things on top of, as we'll see as we go out through the semester, that makes your life easier. And it's one of the advantages of tr that transactions give you. So um, I can't prove this scientifically, but I would say it's my impression from in my various travels of going to companies and, and talking with people that are running in memory databases is that the, the memory footprint is the major issue that people are dealing with, right? It, in terms of both cost, because memory's not cheap, um, but also the, the, just the, 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 um, the, you know, the size of the database you, you want to be able to store in, in the hardware that you have. So they're willing to pay the additional computational overhead for having more, uh, for better garbage collection, like the interval stuff and the, the more fine grain garbage collection, they're willing to pay that penalty in exchange for reducing memory. Um, so this is why I think the, I mean, in the case of the HANA paper, they have, they talk about a hybrid approach where it's sort of all of the above. I think that's actually a really good idea. Um, it might be very specific to the, the kind of work that SAP, SAP is looking at uh, and their sort of main application, their main customer is, in, is themselves. Um, for general purpose uh, applications, I think that the interval and single version, maybe some grouping is, is the right way to go. But I think we should add an interrolling to, to our own system. So, okay. So with that, I want to very briefly introduce the first project, which we uh, announced earlier today. So the first project is an individual project that everyone's doing by themselves. And the idea is basically you're going to introduce yourself to, to our, the code base of our, of our new database system. And you're going to learn how to do profiling in a highly concurrent environment. So what we're going to do is we're going to provide you with a, uh, a certain branch of our code that has a known problem that we have in our system that we've identified. And we're going to, you're going to learn how to use perf, which is a profiling tool to figure out where that bottleneck is and then go about, you know, refactoring the code to move some data structures around, introduce some new special latches in the right places to, to alleviate that bottleneck and to improve your scalability on our system. So again, it's a uh, it's an individual project because we want each of you to do this separately, uh, and that way, you, when you go do the final project, everyone's gonna be able to contribute e uh, equally because they're all you know we've, you've all worked on the system enough. So, I've already talked about this before. Uh, Peloton is dead. We have a new system that we don't have a name for yet. We get, we still got to figure that out. Um, so, at a high level, it's an in-memory HTAP MVC database minute system. So here's a bunch of features that uh, that the system will have. A lot of this code actually is being ported over from Peloton and cleaned up. Um, so I would say from this portion down, this is what you, you don't have to worry about any of this for the first project. Um, and you may be thinking like, oh, you know, what the hell does all this actually mean? I'll be covering all of this throughout the entire semester. So like by the end of the semester, you'll be able to know what the hell each of these are, right? Um, the ultimate goal of this project, but I haven't really talked about so far, um, is that we're trying to build a new system from scratch in order to make it be self-driving or autonomous. So I'll, we'll have this in the, in the last class or the last lecture, we'll talk about what a self-driving database actually is. The basic idea is that we want this thing to be able to tune and optimize itself automatically without any human in intervention. And so we, 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 we decided to build the system from the ground up to uh, because that's the best way in order, to, or to, in order for us to achieve this goal, because we have complete control of the entire architecture. So again, we'll talk about more of this later. Um, I'm sort of showing you the list of all these different features here, because it's like, I remember when I was like an undergrad, you you know, you start a new course and you look at like the textbook, look at the back of it, like, and you see something like, how the hell am I ever going to actually learn any of this, shit, right? Um, and so I, for me, I hope that you guys are going to have the same impression. You look at all these like buzzwords or mumbo jumbo I have listed here. And you're like, I don't know what any of this means. You will know what all this means uh, by the end of the semester. So it's going to be really cool. So I'm excited for that. All right. So as I said, the project write-out explains exactly what you need to do uh, and how you go about profiling the system and figuring out what you, uh, where the issue is and what you need to fix. Um, so we're not going to tell you what to fix exactly. We'll tell you how to find the problem. Um, so the, the source code you'll be downloading, the, 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 the repository, it's going to have a bunch of test cases, unit tests, uh, that you can run, but also a bunch of uh, micro benchmarks that test various parts of the system that you'd be focused on in, in for transaction management. So 
the for the profiling you want to do, you're going to you're going to only want to run the concurrent read micro benchmark because that will hit the bottlenecks that that you should be looking for. But there's all these other benchmarks you're going to want to run run as well to make sure the changes that you make don't break them or or cause any unexpected failures. So we're grading you on the concurrent read micro benchmark for you know what speed you get. But we can check for correctness by essentially running all these other micro benchmarks as well. Because you don't want like you make some change in the transaction management code for that that affects right, you know, right transactions that the concurrent read micro benchmark doesn't hit, but all these other micro benchmarks will fail now. So you want, that's how you're gonna be able to check to make sure that you're not breaking something uh, that's unexpected. So we strongly encourage you to go do your additional testing beyond the things that we give you. And so that essentially is going to mean taking these other micro benchmarks we provide you and maybe tweaking them to change their access patterns or change them or threads or that they're going to be running so that you explore different parts of the, of the code base that you may not uh, have tested otherwise. And we have ways to do code coverage checks, checks as well to see whether your, the code that you modified is actually being uh, adequately uh, exercised in these experiments as well. So for grading, uh, the project write-up has all the information about this, but it's essentially there's two phases. One, there's the correctness phase, where we again, we run all the tests to make sure your thing actually produces the correct result. But then now we're gonna compare your implementation against the implementation written by Lin Ma, the TA, and see how fast your implementation is compared to him. So the, the grade you'll get will be based on your relative performance difference between his implementation. So if you get exactly what, with what he gets, I think you get like 90%. In order to get 100% or higher, you have to go faster than what, what he's done, right? So it's not just like, I got it all to work correctly and I'm gonna turn them in. There's actually some other things that we're not gonna talk about you could go through and, and, and find to fi fix things up. So again, on class on Monday next week, I will teach you guys how to do additional profiling with Perf and Call Ryan and other things to go test and maybe try to find some additional ways to optimize the system. Um, but it's again, this is this important aspect of this, this course is not only are you writing correct code, you're writing high performance code, right? Because the way, obvious way to fix the problem is just take a latch on the entire, uh, you know, database and only let one transaction ever run, run at a time. That won't, that, you know, that'll run correctly, but that's going to be slow. And so we're grading you based on performance as well. So, we're, in addition to this, we're also going to run uh, Google Sanitizer checks that are in the build pipeline, and that just checks to make sure you're not doing memory leaks or some other weird stuff with your uh, allocations. And then we're also very strict about how we do uh, uh, formatting in the code. Um, and this is just, again, void some of the issues we had in, in the old system. So we will run Clang Format and Clang Tidy. Uh, this is why we run C++17. So this is going to do very strict syntax checking. So you have to follow uh, uh, our formatting guidelines to make sure that your code conforms to uh, our standard. And we, we essentially follow the Google style guide or something very similar to it. So there's a documentation page that explains all of this in, in more detail. So basically what happens is if you write code that doesn't follow our, our style guide, the build will fail and you get a zero, all right? So you have to get, you have to, get it to work. All right, so the, our current data system only built on uh, Ubuntu 18.04 and OS X, and I think it's the latest version. If you're running on Windows and don't want to you know, switch over to Linux or whatever, uh, you can run this in a VM. We're, you know, we'll talk about it in the next slide. You know, you're gonna do all your testing on Amazon anyway, which you want to use a, a Linux VM. Um, but for your local development, you could do it in, inside a VM. So this is Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, I'm assuming everyone here has access to a machine that you can do some development on. Um, there's, if, you, if for whatever reason you don't you don't have one, uh, contact and let me know. I actually I don't know whether, and I'm pretty sure it won't build in any of the Android machines because we need the latest version of Clang and GCC, and the Android machines are, haven't been updated. But um, you know, again, you can do this inside of VM. Um, to, if, you, if you can't, if you, if you don't want to set up your local environment to use nothing but Linux. Um, the important thing I'll stress too also is that. You can do all your development locally on your laptop, uh, but you're not gonna be able to identify the bottleneck that we're asking you to look for unless you're running a machine that has more than 20 cores. So if your laptop has four cores, you're gonna run perf and you're not gonna see the bottleneck we want you to find. 
right? Because there's not going to be enough con enough concurrency, enough uh, parallelism hitting these hitting these contention points. So that's why you have to, we're asking you to run on a machine with more cores. And because most of us don't have machines with 20 cores, um, we're giving each of you guys $50. Uh, so I sent an email out this morning that everyone's going to get $50 from Amazon AWS. Um, so you basically go on EC2, instantiate an ins a Linux instance on this this C5 9x large. I think it's 36 cores. And to build the system, run the perfect experiments we asked you to run, collect some data about where the bottleneck is, go now down, bring, you know, on your local machine, fix it, fix it up, commit it, and then try to run it on, on Amazon. So we're only giving you $50. If you run this instance type, the C5 9X large on demand, it's going to cost you $1.53 an hour. You're also going to have to pay for EBS, which is some trivial amount, but that's still always running as well because that's storage. Um, when, it's po when as much as possible, try to use a spot instance because it's going to be a fraction of the price. Of course, now these they, they can take them away from you at any time. But you know, it's not like you're gonna be doing this nonstop. You make a little change, run the experiment, right? Come back to it. And if, and if your spot instance gets taken away, you just fire it back up. Um, so try to use a spot instance as much as possible. Do not run out of money, because uh, if you run out of money, they're gonna charge your credit card and you can't come to me and ask, and ask for more, right? Because everyone only gets $50. And that should be enough for this project. It shouldn't take you, you know, hours and hours and hours on and Amazon, and you're gonna burn through all your money. All right, so the the Deadline is uh, February 27th at, at 11 p.m. As we say in the uh, on the project write-up, uh, if you miss this deadline, uh, then it, you lose 25% for every 24 hours that you're late from this deadline. Um, you're gonna be submitting the source code and a final PDF of the final report with screenshots of your perf commands and output um, on Gradescope. Uh, but you know, we'll, when we actually run your source code you provide us and do grading in terms of the benchmarking and correctness, we're going to run that on a different machine here at CMU, all right? Because again, Grayscope is only a single thread. You're, 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 you're never going to hit the contention bottlenecks. So that means that you'll submit your code to Grayscope. We'll build it and make sure it actually builds and runs the, the basic experiments. But that's not going to be your final grade because we can't check for the things we want to check on a Grayscope VM, right? So you think of like Gradescope as like the smoke test, that there isn't some stupid bug in your code that prevents it from compiling in our environment, right? So you'll submit it just to see whether it actually it can build, but all, you need to test yourself on the Amazon machine we're providing you, okay? All right, so again, the deadline is February 27th at, at, at midnight, um, and then the, the webpage is up now with all the information about uh, the project and how to get started, okay? Next class, we'll be doing uh, uh, now index locking and latching. So we're going to start off talking about more traditional locking methods for indexes, and how to enforce serializability, and then we'll talk about how different ways to actually implement latching and, and some problems that can arise with latch-free environments and with latching environments. Okay? All right, guys, stay warm, and I will see you on Monday next week. Thank you. Gotta bounce to get the 40 ounce bottle. Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't no puzzle, I guzzle, cause I'm more man. I'm down in the 40, and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cloth, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw about three in the freezer so I can kill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, oops, don't spill it. Cause St. Isles is said, the pain I wet. You drink it down with the guys, it'll run head. Take back the pack of duds. You go get you some St. Isles and drink it to the suds. Billy D is the silly cheese, sit down with the weak guys. Be a man and get a can of St. Isles.